Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome and thank you for coming to this uh, award ceremony uh, with speeches and uh, hopefully some lively Q&A uh, and good fellowship uh, from the uh, assembled audience. Um, I see I, what I think are some familiar faces out there, uh, at least half this much coming up. Yeah, oh, there. Thank you, Bill. <laughs> And um, so, uh, welcome. Uh, glad to be among friends here this afternoon. Uh, I'm here because I'm the uh, have the honor to serve as the chaplain of the Society of Catholic Social Scientists. And each year, that organization uh, gives out an award that I'll be describing in more detail in just a minute. Uh, and uh, when the award E is in the Washington D.C. area, they ask it. Presented uh, a little less gravitas than our president, um, Stephen Crayson, but nonetheless, I'm able, uh, I think, to help out and glad to help out. Uh, it's okay. Thank you very much. Um, the uh, Society of Catholic Social Scientists uh, is uh, an organ scholarly organization uh, of uh, social scientists broadly conceived. Uh, it is uh, dedicated to promoting and conducting rigorous social scientific research within the parameters of Orthodox Catholic doctrine. Uh, if you are interested in more information about that or becoming a member, you can go to the website, which is conveniently named catholicsocialscientists.org. Each year, uh, we give out the Pope Pius XI Award which is given to those who have made a contribution toward building up a true Catholic sociology, following from that phrasing in uh, that Pope's uh, famous encyclical, Quattrogesimo Anno. Uh, this year, we are presenting the award, oh wait, I'm sorry, I'm supposed to say a couple of words about the Institute for Human Ecology, which is uh, co-sponsoring this event. The Institute for Human Ecology is the nation's leading academic institute committed to increasing scientific understanding of the economic, cultural, and social conditions vital for human flourishing. Drawing on the Catholic intellectual tradition, the mission of the IHE is to educate students, sponsor multidisciplinary and social scientific research, advise church leadership and policymakers, and organize symposia conferences and lectures for the academy Square. IHE programs challenge the deterministic and reductive institutions and arguments that thwart the pursuit of greater freedom and prosperity for all. So obviously there's a great affinity between these two organizations. Um, the, the Society of Catholic Social Scientists gives out uh, several awards. Uh, its highest award is the Pope Pius XI Award. We're honoring at this pleased to uh, award it this year uh, to Mary Everstein. Uh, and so I'm going to uh, call her up at this time. Well, let's see, how should I do this? Let, I guess I should read her bio first and then give the award. And then she'll go on and give her speech. Um, Mary Everstein holds the Panula Chair in Christian Culture at the Catholic Information Center and is a senior fellow at the Faith and Reason Institute. Her latest book is Primal Screams, How the Sexual Revolution Created Identity Politics with commentaries by Rod Dreher, Mark Lilla, and Peter Thiel. Other books include It's Dangerous to Believe, How the West Really Lost God, and my personal favorite, Adam and Eve After the Pill. Mrs. Everstadt's writing has appeared in many magazines and journals. Her 2010 novel, The Loser Letters, about a young woman in rehab struggling with atheism, was adapted for stage and premiered at Catholic University in, in fall 2017. Uh, Seton Hall University awarded Mrs. Everstadt an honorary doctorate in Humane Letters in 2014. She is married to author Nicholas Everstadt. They have four children. Updates about her work can be found on her website, maryeverstadt.com. And so I would like to invite her to come up here without further ado as I present to her this award, which says, the Society of Catholic Social Scientists, Pope Pius XI Award, for contributions toward the building up of a true Catholic social science, presented to Mary Everstadt, September 15, 2021. I also want to 
want to give to Mary a copy of the premier product of the Society of Catholic Social Scientists, which comes with help carrying it back to her car should she need it. But it is the encyclopedia of Catholic social thought, social science, and social policy, uh, which is three volumes chock full of uh, articles on the issues of the day from a perspective that is faithful to the Catholic magisterium. Um, I recognize, I think, a couple of authors of some of those articles here. Uh, yes, thank you, Bill, and others uh, among us. So it, it is a uh, very high quality uh, resource uh, for those who deal in these areas. And so we're giving a copy of this to Mary, all three volumes. <laughs> if you, can, you can put it down on the table there. <laughs> And also, last but not least, well, maybe it is the least, a copy of our uh, much coveted uh, SCSS coffee mug. <laughs> <laughs> so without further ado, uh, I'll invite Mary up to give her award address, which is titled, The Cross Amid the Chaos. Thank you. I'm overwhelmed by my, my bounty there. Thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon, and thank you for that lovely welcome. It's profoundly humbling to see these communities of fellowship gathered literally and figuratively for this event. I'm grateful for the efforts of many people in bringing us together today, including the Society of Catholic Social Scientists, especially Father Paul, the Institute for Human Ecology here at CUA, uh, and especially my admired friend, <coughs> Professor Catherine Bacallet, who will be commenting on these remarks, and the Sociology Department, also here at Cherished Catholic University of America. It's invigorating as well to be joined by the ever-inspirational President John Garvey and members of the Honors Program, by our other friends present or watching this on video later, including those <clears throat> at the Catholic Information Center, where I'm honored to hold the first panel of chair, as Father Paul kindly mentioned. It is a joy to represent the CIC here today, as well as another home to Faith and Reason Institute, whose leader, Dr. Robert Royal, <clears throat> addressed the CSSS at this same event a few years ago. These and other distinguished comrades and mentors set a daunting standard. It is one thing to have big shoes to fill. It's another to feel dwarfed by them. Worse yet, I feel dwarfed in them. Franz Kafka turned his character Gregory into a cockroach overnight, but I feel as if I've awakened as a character in Mary Norton's series, The Borrowers, peering over the edge of the shoe leather but trusting that we are brought together today for purposes beyond our own, let's meditate in this moment of cultural sobriety. As I kept thinking about what to share today, one sentence kept coming to mind. It was penned by novelist extraordinaire Evelyn Waugh. It appeared in a disarmingly casual account that he gave to a newspaper in 1930 about the reasons for his conversion to the Catholic Church. Waugh summarized that momentous decision in 28 neat words. He said, in the present phase of European history, the essential issue is no longer between Catholicism on one side and Protestantism on the other, but between Christianity and chaos. And he spelled chaos with a capital C. Christianity or chaos? In a sense, the choice between the two has been perpetual since the resurrection. But to say that it's ever thus and to throw up our hands before the world is a dodge, especially for Catholics, especially now in a moment when so many are tempted to do just that. We are called to read the signs of the times, not to whine about them. So let's start by staring this thing in the face and setting out the distinct characteristics of chaos in this moment 
our moment. What can we see? The first thing we see is that we continue to live in the age spied by Matthew Arnold and Henri de Lubac and Alexander Solzhenitsyn and other clairvoyants. That is, the modern age, whose drama consists of successive waves of secularization, encroaching ever more insistently on territories once thought to be gods and gods alone. The second thing we can see is equally conspicuous. It is that the forms of chaos characteristic of our time are unlike those that preceded us in modern history. Compare this era, for example, to Evelyn Waugh's. In 1930, the year he entered the church, one world war was already behind humanity, even as another one impended. In the lifetime of people like him, spanning roughly the first half of the 20th century, chaos had a different signature. It resided in war, dislocation, and stupendous carnage. Despite that carnage, though, many social pillars then stood firm. Individual families were ravaged by the wars, but the institution of the family was not. Demonic Nazi anthropology had its day, as would communist anthropology too. But outside those malignant precincts, a Christian understanding of creation and redemption and meaning still prevailed across the West and within the captive nations of the East. The Catholic Church was steadfast as well. In 1930, Pius the not the eleventh. I'm sorry, I'm bad with numbers. Pius the eleventh, especially Roman numerals. The visionary for whom this award is named was Pope. He would go on to found <clears throat> Vatican Radio the very next year to proclaim the gospel in the world, as he put it jubilantly. Although chaos was then insinuating itself into some Protestant churches, the Catholic Church appeared exempt as Evelyn Waugh pointed out when he cited the coherent and consistent nature of Catholic teaching as one reason for his conversion. Now, as even that short summary shows, although we are only 90 years removed from 1930, it feels more like 90 light years. <clears throat> Consider a quick checklist of the scene we know today. First, there is compounding family chaos, brought on by a radical social experiment, now six plus decades in the making. Elemental human bonds have been frayed and cut, and the institution of the family itself weakened on a scale never seen before. Second, and symbiotic, there is also compounding psychic chaos of all kinds. For decades, the rise in mental illness has been documented beyond dispute. Anxiety, depression, and other afflictions resulting from disconnection and loneliness have become endemic, especially among the youngest and the most frail. Irrationalism has become unbound. Third, there is political chaos. Though its causes are many, the dissolution of clan and family leave their marks here too. To put it rhetorically, how could the unattached and dispossessed people of our times produce anything but a disordered, angry public language? <clears throat> Fourth, there is anthropological chaos of a whole new order. The Western world is gripped by an identity crisis. In its latest form, magical thinking about gender has escaped from the academy and now transforms society and law. A magical thinking so preposterous that little children could call it out. In a shocking descent, anything, or unlike any in recorded history, many people today no longer know what little children know, which is who they are. Once more, irrationalism is unbound. Fifth, 
there is intellectual chaos. Outside this indispensable university, an indispensable Franciscan university, and other faithful institutions, American education, especially elite education, has been hiding in a cuckoo's nest of postmodernism for decades. People who do not believe in truth now run institutions charged with discerning it. A little while ago, an atheist was elected chief chaplain at Harvard. Why not? If there is no truth, there are no contradictions. In much of the academy, irrationalism is not only unbound, it rules. Sixth and most consequential, there is chaos of a new order in significance among Catholics across the Western world. It arises from people who want to transform church teaching and their animus against other people who hold to the truth of that teaching. This divide is excruciatingly visible in public life as leaders proudly brandishing the Catholic label just as proudly defy the catechism and key points of canon law day in and day out. What we have to understand is that magical thinking drives this kind of chaos too. The label pro-abortion Catholic makes as much logical sense as atheist chaplain or former man. All participate in the same <coughs> irrationalism that is a signature of our time. All demand that we cancel Aristotle, that we believe A and not A simultaneously. Now, what can we discern today by staring into this void? this void whose very existence has become an inescapable fact of life for most of us, the void that makes many anxious for our descendants as American Catholics have never been anxious before. We discern a truth that should stiffen our spines. In every one of these cases, chaos has been whipped into catastrophic strength by secularization itself. In the time to come, however long the reckoning might take, this spells trouble for the secularized order and capital V vindication for the church. The rise in mental distress and the decline of organized religion, for example, are not randomly occurring phenomena. Social science confirms that people who have robust Social bonds are more likely to thrive than people who don't. Religious faith confers those bonds. Social science also shows that the fractured family and other forms of isolation increase the risks of anxiety, depression, substance abuse, and other vexations. All of these have been exacerbated by the Western flight from God. Consider once more that the most unchurched generation in America, the nuns, is also the most afflicted. We see clearly that the loss of the capital F father and the contemporary loss of so many earthly fathers are joined at the root. Secularization is also behind today's family chaos. By embracing divorce, fatherlessness, and abortion, Humanity has inflicted wounds on itself whose measure has only begun to be taken. Now we begin to see that what starts at home doesn't stay at home. The feral children of the West now pour into the streets, frantically trying to substitute identity politics for the primordial bonds of which they have been deprived. Identity politics is a pitiful attempt at emotional alchemy by souls desperate for connection. And this, too, signals vindication for the magisterium's uncompromising teachings about who we really are and what is really good for us. As for the chaos besetting the church, this, too, is rooted in secularization. 
It has become standard to speak of conservative and liberal Catholics, but the political labels deceive. The real Catholic divide in our time is between people who try to stand as signs of contradiction in this world and people who capitulate. It is between Catholics who want powerful social trends to influence and transform the church and Catholics who don't. It is between souls who believe the catechism is true and souls who want to edit the catechism with a red pen gleefully supplied by a disapproving secularism. The real divide is between Catholics who want temporal demands to trump the cross and Catholics who know the cross cannot be trumped. The point here is not some religious triumphalism. I wish we could engage in some religious triumphalism, but as my kids say, too soon. The point is that secularization is exacting costs in one realm after another, and secularized tastemakers, whether inside or outside the church, refuse to acknowledge them. And so it falls to others, including the scholars present today, literally and figuratively, to illuminate that record. Your work is vital in this moment for two reasons. First, because today's chaos causes multiple forms of suffering that might be ameliorated if only they were properly understood. And second, because today's chaos amounts to inadvertent proof that the catechism gets humanity right. There is another truth amid today's confusions that has long gone unsaid. Our secularizing culture is not just any culture. No, our secularizing culture is an inferior culture. It is small of heart. It defines suffering down. It regards the victims of its social experiments not as victims, but as so much acceptable collateral damage justified by the experiments. This is secularism's unspoken secret. It is also secularism's greatest vulnerability. This mission to define suffering down can be seen, for example, in efforts that would recast the horrors of prostitution as anodyne sex work. This is what deprives, this is what drives the attempts to normalize pornography, ignoring the calamitous cost to men and women in romance. It powers the push to shut pregnancy centers and adoption agencies, never mind whether poor women and children need them. It whitewashes recurring data about suicide rates, eating disorders, substance abuse, and other signs of mental distress within the transgender population, and other populations where acknowledging human damage might jeopardize political agendas. Again, the chaos unleashed on the West has spread acute forms of misery across society. But the architects and defenders of an a-Christian, sometimes anti-Christian, social order turn a blind eye. So it falls to faithful scholars to tell the truth about the cost of secularization, because scholars who are part of the chaos out there can't or won't. <clears throat> In closing, one more quotation helps to summarize the importance of your collective missions in academia now. Historian Christopher Dawson opened an essay on Christianity and Western culture with this sentence. Quote, the survival of a civilization depends on the continuity of its educational tradition, unquote. This is where the Society of Catholic Social Scientists and the rest of the great fellowship represented here today comes in. The secularized academy has abdicated its vocation. It denies the value of tradition. It makes a mockery of the Western patrimony. In the struggle to hold fast to the cross amid today's chaos, 
Countercultural scholars are the first line of defense. This is true not only for those outside your circles who need your work today, it is also true for the scholars to come, those who will be reading the record of 2021 in the future. Those thinkers of tomorrow will look back in astonishment and perhaps even pity at today's magical thinking. They will need instead facts, figures, arguments, and evidence, especially evidence about the human costs of today's experiment in secularization. And they will find that library in your collective work. Someday, a re-evangelized civilization will contemplate the beginning of the 21st century and try to take the measure of its chaos. Those people of the future will understand, as many in authority do not today, that you are speaking truth into the void of this century and giving voice to the voiceless in a defiant time. It is an honor to stand with you today and ever in that same mission. Thank you very much.
In any case, the good chaplain at the Catholic Student Center, himself a UT graduate and a convert, he scratched his head after the talk and he asked me, if these things that you say are known by social scientists, why aren't they more commonly known? <laughs> and why aren't they understood by people, he said. <laughs> How can we prevent the kinds of suffering that you describe? Indeed, the sufferings that uh, Mary has just described so poignantly and, and, and across, it's a thread across all of her work. He expressed a great deal of frustration in his question. And he seemed to be asking me, what is the point of all of this? It doesn't make a difference. In fact, uh, the next morning, I met with a dear friend of mine who described how he was considering abandoning a book project that he was a few chapters into because he said to me, it just won't make a difference. <laughs> no one will hear this. Uh, feeling the good chaplain's angst, I said, uh, I replied with the only answer that seemed available to me at that moment. Um, I said that the truth is worth pursuing, it seems to me, because the truth is not instrumental. The truth is not for something, but the truth is someone. And that truth is God, who is the Word, and we are born into this world to seek Him, to run to Him and find Him, as the great prayer of St. Bonaventure says. Many of us, and I count myself among this number, became social scientists out of concern for the suffering of people. We wanted to make a difference. And this is fine. It's well and good. But the intention to make a difference this, too, has to be purified. It is purified in us as social scientists when good findings, for instance, don't see the light of day, and when earnest work earns us the reputation of bigots. It is purified, in fact, when tidal waves of scholarly funding rain down on those who would distort the image of God in humanity, or more benignly, when others refuse to connect those dots and make the normative arguments that speak truth into the chaos. Our intentions are in fact purified when it looks like we are making no difference. It is the purification of the cross. But we do hear the voice of the divine gardener in John 20. Woman, why are you crying? Whom do you seek? But after all, it is the Lord. T.S. Eliot anticipates this purifying journey. At the end of all of our exploring will be to arrive where we started and know the place for the first time. It is the Lord. Looking at our youthful idealism, my youthful idealism, we must affirm it was not in vain to seek the truth, to do good. But we were in vain. We were vain. We wanted to make a difference. And the cross, however, points the way. And its graces confer the power to name the truth, a power that the enemies of the cross have not. It is then, I take it, our office and our mission as Catholic scholars to name the truth. For this task, it is not sufficient to be technically competent. To be truly wise and humanistic and good, we must begin by getting it right about God. Without the Christ who reveals man to himself, Man remains a mystery to man. What are the notes, then, of this purified pursuit of truth? Well, we might at least say it is patient, it is kind, it does not envy, it is not boastful, and it is not proud. This is, in fact, a vocation, not a career. And this vocation resides in many hearts nourished by grace. And our sister in Christ and honoree, Mary, and many often hidden souls who persist in writing and teaching in relative obscurity. Mary's comments have helped us to a heavy portion of needed sobriety about our moment. Ours is not a time for complacency or platitudes, and not a time for small research agendas. We must be men and women for this time because many souls are being lost. God, our captain, I think, doesn't need our research. But he does need our holiness. And for this, uh, for us, with this vocation to seek the truth in this way, our holiness requires that we name the truth. And the witness of our holiness, while it may not save the world, in fact, the world has already been saved, but our 
witness of holiness may save those at least given to us, our families, our friends, and our students, above all. Because witness, as Pope Benedict reminded us, is the greatest argument for the faith. So, inspired by Mary, let us be good soldiers, take up our cross, and name the truth with brave but big hearts. Thank you.
and the east had the cross without a flame. Nowadays, and it was very easy because it was in a very crude but very powerful contrast. Now we have a secularism with the spiritual values or politics becomes religion. How would you reconcile those two? Because I like what Fulton Sheen was speaking in a very clear language, and now with all this confusion that we are witnessing, it's very difficult to have a clarity. That's why I often return to this thought of identity politics and what it really means, because what it really does is to channel an uninformed religious impulse that's arising from all of the unchurched young people in the West. And I think that over time they will find that the kind of consolation they are seeking in politics is a thin consolation. And it's to be hoped that over time that points people back in the direction of the cross. You know, for all the bad news, I do want to mention a few uh, bright spots that did not exist when uh, Richard John Newhouse was writing 30 years ago. There's been, I, I think we see the seeds of future religious revival in this country. I don't know how many people here might live to see it. But there are all kinds of forms of organic fellowship that did not exist before. There are, for example, the Dominicans are running to mystic circles on every Ivy League campus in the United States. There was nothing like this 30 years ago. The Fellowship of Catholic University Students is on over 100 campuses. Um, the classical school movement is thriving in opposition to what's happening in the public schools in the United States. So pro as bad as, pardon? Pro-life youth. Pro-life youth. As bad as the bad news is, we are seeing revival, um, at least at the microscopic level. That had to be a planned question. Uh, it got the discussion going. It did. Um, now, I'm a Protestant, and I personally think we would be toast today if it wasn't for the Catholic Church. Really toast. There's just no anchor anywhere. Um, so my question is, as a Protestant, where do we go? Mary, you opened your talk with, uh, it's not Catholic versus Protestant anymore. It's Christian versus chaos. Where do we go together to, to find each other, to, to band together, to do something about this? Uh, we're kind of doing it you know, in the school systems now, et cetera, et cetera. But me as a Protestant, if I just go to the quote unquote ecumenical mainline stuff, I see the people that are getting us in, the, that, that, that got us here. So where, where the heck do I look you know, for, for fellowship on this? state the obvious here. <laughs> There's one word on everybody's mind right now, and I think it's Rome. Um, but, you know, it's interesting because uh, I was talking recently with some people in Uganda, and they are seeing the same thing. One of them said, we are not up against Protestantism versus Catholicism anymore. It's Christianity, he didn't say chaos, but the same idea. And you know, just as the, the dire nature of the moment has for, forged new kinds of fellowship in schools and universities, as I was just saying, I, I think the same is going to be true religiously. But we all know that a tradition-minded Protestant now has far more in common with tradition-minded Catholics than the people in both those institutions who want to tear down the teaching. And we'll go somewhere good from there. I just have a small comment. Um, I don't know who you are. Mary apparently does. <laughs> so I want to say this, that um, what we share um, on Christianity versus the chaos, I mean, we certainly share the sacred scriptures. And I want to just tell you a story that's sort of dear to my heart, because I think it's in, some, in, some, in one part funny, but in another part um, meaningful, which is that um, 
maybe six years ago now when my husband was, we were having a walk and he was going through the things he thought he might still want to write, you know, before his time was up. I, this sounds morbid, but that's the sort of thing we talked about. And he said, well, you know, what's my list? You know, the, the books and the contributions that I want to make. And we, we came up with a list, and was like eight or 10 things. He went home and didn't do any of them. <laughs> he went home and almost the next day he began translating the sacred scripture. Um, and he began translating the Gospel of Mark. You know, and it struck me that that's a kind of, uh, that is itself a sign of the time, a kind of return to what it means to be a disciple of Christ. And that's something we share. And, you know, he went on to translate the Gospel of John. And I'm told the Gospel of Matthew is coming. <laughs> He's working on it. Um, but that struck me. There's, um, going back to my trip to the University of Texas, um, the chaplain, while he was frustrated with what I presented and sort of, you know, what do we do with all of this, uh, one of the things he said afterwards is, to Mary's point about signs of hopefulness, he said, apart from these other concerns, he said they've never had more uh, more people in, in, in formation to become Catholics. He said people walk in the door that we've never met before, and they say, you know, I got up and started reading the scripture because nothing made sense. <laughs> and I want to become a Catholic. I want to become a Christian. So he said they, they, they can't believe the number of people uh, studying to become disciples of Christ in this time. So I think that that's something we can expect. And so maybe a return to the scriptures. Good. Okay. Uh, I, just, I just want to comment in response to yours. That, that, that we Catholics need the Protestants too. You, you offer a whole lot to our lives. I was at the National Catholic Prayer Breakfast yesterday morning and heard a presentation of to Catholics on how to present the faith, uh, I recognized it as the, the four spiritual laws from the Protestant world 30 years ago, as exactly what it was, uh, word for word. And it's just percolating into the Catholic life. It would be transformative if Catholics picked that up. Uh, I just did it. It was on a, a debate about same-sex marriage in, in Switzerland earlier this afternoon, hosted by a Protestant group. They, the Catholics wouldn't do anything like that, but it's having great effect. Uh, so we need you guys also. Uh, if, you know, that's my two cents. So this question is to Kathleen. I wanted to come from India, and I just graduated from Dilson, an international development and development economics, inside by social teaching center. And I wanted to comment on uh, economic view, and do you think does the present economic systems uh, help the family ecosystem? Uh, do you think uh, the crony capitalism in which we're going is the right direction? If not, what is the right direction that the economic system should be thinking about to better the family systems? Because I've read, I've, I'm aware of distributism and all of that. Distributism. Is it possible in this centralized technological world? Just want to hear your thoughts. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we have one person up here with a PhD in economics, so that's going to direct this question to her, and you can pass it on to Mary. <laughs> <laughs> oh, <clears throat> talk about a question I was not prepared to answer. <laughs> I certainly have a few thoughts on that, but um, I, I'm not prepared to give you a, a big answer, a grand narrative. Um, but uh, the things that you mentioned, party capitalism and very points about system. Um, I have at least found in my own thought, in my own thinking about these things, uh, a lot of fruit in returning to kind of the history of economic thought and thinking about the things that we used to know, and things that we don't seem to know anymore. Uh, for instance, I mean, just just to give you a for instance, which may suggest other things that are beyond the, this conversation. I was uh, sitting with a friend of mine who works at the Federal Reserve Board of Governors uh, recently. And I, I won't name him, I can't name him, but I, I, said, <laughs> I said to him, um, you know, I don't have a formal opinion on some of the things that he studies. He studies things related to financial stability. And I, I said something about the money supply. And he said, the money supply? I said, wow, I haven't looked at that in five years. <laughs> so. As an economist or student of economics, that should mean a lot to you. <laughs> so, that, that more or less sums up everything that I have to say, right? Um, which, which is, I mean, one, <laughs> which is to say that um, 
we have become, in general, in terms of the systems and the way we relate to economic realities, in the way that we relate to political and familiar ones, we have become in many ways detached from things that are, that are real. We don't even know what money is anymore. <laughs> and we don't really know how to define it and as we enter the age of digital currency and you know, potentially central bank digital currencies. Um, I'm certainly well aware of the, in my opinion, disastrous and inhumane experiments with, with, with cash that have taken place in your country, at the experimentation of certain groups of elite tyrants. Um, and so I, I think that, um, certainly I have a lot of suspicion about this, the current system and how detached we are from things that are, are real, which is in some sense from an economic perspective, the ordinary man making a living. And we really, uh, family life to economic life in important ways that are very real. So let that simply be all that I think I should say now because I think the focus should be some other uh, comments that Mary might have. But um, I would be very glad to continue discussing with you. Well, of course, it's pertinent because Catholic social thought puts forth the idea that uh, the economy must operate within a moral framework. Right, without which it becomes destructive. Um, how many here think that our economy is operating within a, a sufficiently robust moral framework? I don't see any hands going up. So, uh, and I, I, I know they, uh, they teach that at Georgetown as well. So it is certainly pertinent to what we're talking about this afternoon. So the economy needs to cross as well, or else it becomes chaos. Is that a good place to stop? Anyone else want to make a type statement of any sort? Well, food gets cold. No, I knew that would kill that. Uh, okay. Uh, thank you so much for uh, coming this afternoon. Oh, I'm sorry, I should get over here in the range of the video. Um, and, uh, it, it's been a wonderful event. Uh, and I would like to uh, end this event uh, by uh, asking uh, a blessing on our time now of sharing and uh, eating food and conversing even more with one another. Would you stand with me? I'll ask the, like the chaplain of the society uh, and invite you to join me as we turn our hearts to our Lord. Uh, and we close this time praying together the great prayer. Hail Mary. The Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death. Amen. And bless the food that we are about to partake. Amen. God bless you all. Thank you. <laughs>